get uh, we're going Harold Wilmington uh, complete uh, Bible knowledge guide and uh, study. Also, we'll be using some Warren Wiersbe uh, as well in our study, and uh, always can find good insights from uh, Warren Wiersbe. Anything you get from these two uh, is good stuff. They love the Lord, have great testimonies of faithfulness to the Lord. Years of study. And then we, of course, add uh, uh, some of our insights and some things uh, that relates as well. Uh, as we begin our study of Psalms, uh, um, Psalms is, can, is very dear and uh, shows our human emotions through different various things that we go through. Uh, it also shows us that we can freely talk to God. And uh, uh, God understands us. God uh, is willing to listen to us. And sometimes when you go through difficulties or whatever you go through, uh, God wants you to, to talk to him honestly. He knows our hearts anyway. And, uh, boy, you, you see God's people in the Psalms just reaching out to God, going through normal life struggles like we go through, uh, difficulties, and talking to God about it. Uh, also, uh, as we think about that, uh, Psalms has a lot of prophecies. A lot of people don't understand that, but uh, many prophecies, and uh, especially about Christ. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a very messianic uh, book and uh, collection here, and uh, of the forty-five Old Testament prophecies about Christ, no less than fourteen are found in the Psalms. And what's interesting is God would let uh, maybe David or somebody go through something uh, experientially that would uh, be that would. Uh, have a picture of what Christ would go through even worse or, or that uh, spoke of his life, uh, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And the same way today as you're studying God's Word and God's teaching you something, He'll let you personally experience uh, His Word. So He's teaching you in many ways and experiences is one of those things. So... Uh, we identify with Christ in that way. We identify with Christ in his sufferings. Uh, but many prophecies are, uh, and you have that in your uh, study there, uh, about uh, the coming Messiah uh, in, in the Psalms that uh, Jesus Christ would fulfill because he was the Messiah. He is the Christ. Okay. And, uh, of course, it has... Special chapters, maybe you have a particular uh, psalm that is very special to you for uh, some reason. I guess uh, Psalm 23 probably would be one of the most popular uh, psalms by people, and a lot of people uh, want that uh, read, read at uh, the funeral. Uh, there's at least three distinct ways one may employ in the study of the Psalms by book division, by authorship, and by subject matter. So, uh, uh, book division, uh, the 150 Psalms naturally fall into five main divisions or sections, uh, with each group ending with a doxology. So, there you have your division, Psalms 1 through 41. 42 through 72, 73 through 89, 90 through 106, 107 through 150. So these ends in a doxology. Uh, 41, chapter 41 goes like this. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting, amen and amen. We're in uh, Psalm 72. It says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things with his glory. A wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. Uh, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So these blessings and blessed, and you see that in each, uh, each division of the, of the five divisions. 
Some believe these five divisions in a general way reflect the main thought expressed in the Pentateuch, uh, the first five books in the Bible. Uh, so uh, like Psalms, the first division of Psalms 1 through verse 41, chapter 1 through chapter 41 corresponds to Genesis. Uh, Psalms 42 through 4, 72 corresponds to Exodus. And Psalms 73 through 89 corresponds to Leviticus. And Psalms 90 through 106 corresponds to Numbers. And Psalms 107 to 150 corresponds to Deuteronomy. The key word is the word of God. He sent his word and healed them over and over. Psalm 119 uh, over and over it, it talks about God's word in one form or another. He'll refer to it as a law or, or various things. Uh, so it is uh, totally given over to the word of God. It may, when it talks about, when the Psalms talks about his law or his testimonies, his ways, his precepts, his statutes, his commandments, his righteous judgments, his word, his ordinances, uh, all those things. And then uh, the Word of God, of course, has a ministry. And, and uh, it's, it ministers to the recipient of, of the Word. Uh, by authorship, uh, we think of David, the number of his psalms. David, uh, God, the Holy Spirit inspired David uh, for at least 75 of the 150 psalms. And there you, you have uh, uh, listed uh, many of his psalms. Uh, and when they were written and why they were written. And that's very important. So like Psalm A, written after his victory over Goliath. So that would correspond with 1 Samuel 17. So when you're reading like 1 Samuel 17, you're seeing the story about David and Goliath. Well, you can go to Psalm 8 and get, get some more insight. Psalm 11, written while he was still living in Saul's court. Uh, so you have these various uh, psalms at certain times uh, in, in the life of David. And Psalm 32 and 51 is very important because it was written in regards to his sins and uh, how he dealt with his sins and how God dealt with him. And uh, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Uh, Asaph. Asaph. And uh, you can read about Asaph. And, uh, the Levitical musician was appointed by David to oversee the psalm services in the tabernacle. Solomon appointed him to see, to oversee the psalm service in the temple. Uh, and this was Asaph. And uh, he worked closely with Heman, Ethan, and Judithon. And uh, he sounded the bronze cymbals, 1 Chronicles 15, 19. He ministered before the ark, praying and giving thanks to God. He led a choir consisting of 288 musicians, he conducted a special musical service during the dedication of Solomon's temple, employing 120 priests sounding trumpets. So uh, the music, notice that psalm, the psalms, what we read in all is like music. It's like they're put in to their like hymns, okay? So it would be their hymnals, and uh, and uh, later will be, uh, of course, employed for like like that. And we get a lot of our praise and worship, and even hymn songs, uh, as well, for us today from from the songs. Uh, Asaph was the forefather of the prophet Jehaziel, who reassured Jehoshaphat the king uh, years later. He had a gift of prophecy. Uh, and uh, he was a music composer. So God used uh, this Asaph, uh, this choir leader, this uh, music uh, leader also to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, to give us psalms. Uh, Heman's another one. He was Samuel's grandson and one of three key Levitical musicians in the time of David. 
his two associates were Asaph and Jedaphon. And uh, uh, these three musicians dressed in fine linen played cymbals and were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets at the dedication of Solomon's temple. Haman uh, also led his 14 sons and three daughters in the musical service of the tabernacle. So, uh, sort of a family thing there. But, uh, uh, as you know, in the, as you can see, music was uh, very, very important. Okay? And, uh, uh, but music's not the only way to worship God. I think that needs to be brought out as well. Uh, music can be a wonderful ministry, but music's not the only way. Some people say, well, let's worship God. You know, let's go to the service and worship God now. And they're saying, when we sing to God, that's one of many ways, okay, to worship God. Uh, sometimes people uh, will say, I think we should just have a, a, a worship service. Well, that's what we do every week. What they're saying is, I think we should just do singing or something. Mm -hmm. And my reply, and if you ever mm -hmm. ask that question, my reply is the same. I think we should just have a preaching service. <laughs> okay. Because uh, it, it, it's through the foolishness of the preaching of the Word, isn't it? Isn't that what the Bible says? Through the foolishness of the preaching of the Word that people get saved. I think good music enhances it, it preaching. Does. It makes, you know, it, it's great, but preaching, yeah. it's just enhancing uh -huh. preaching. Exactly. I mean, that's my feeling. Uh -huh. Exactly. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> Of course, I'm coming from a pastor perspective, but uh, music people are, they're different. Uh, uh, I want to hurt this. Wait a minute now. <laughs> that, was, that was my Y'all well, got a little more than just music. I'm talking about just the purest music. I mean, especially, uh, they think different, okay? They're, they're a little bit different thinking. There's nothing wrong with that. They're going to come from a different perspective. It's like a painter. Somebody who's an artist, okay, they're different, okay? They're going to see, come across, see things a little different, okay? Have a little perspective. Come from emotions, feelings, okay? Just notice the difference, okay? It's very important. And we see how God creates the different uh, people. Uh, Ethan, uh, uh, well, first Heman wrote, later wrote Psalm 88, which includes one of the most despondent prayers in all the Bible. Uh, Ethan, so up and down. Uh, Ethan, uh, he was a Levite priestly musician who led singing both during the time of the ark was brought into Jerusalem by David and afterwards. And uh, he later wrote Psalm 89, known as the Psalm of the Davidic Covenant. Uh, then Solomon. Solomon was the son of David and Israel's wisest king who ruled for 40 years. Two psalms are attributed to Solomon, Psalm 72 and 127. Uh, Psalm 72 has both prayer and prophecy. And Psalm 127 is, uh, is uh, one that you'll probably hear uh, preached uh, you know, by every pastor sometime or another, uh, for sure. And uh, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord build, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. That's verses 1 and 2. And then Moses, Psalm 90. Moses, Moses was Israel, of course, great deliverer and lawgiver. Uh, um, so Psalm 90 would be the oldest of the Psalms uh, there. Hezekiah, uh, the 13th king over Judah. Uh, ten psalms are attributed to him. And you have those there. Uh, the sons of Korah. These descendants of Korah wrote ten psalms. And uh, you have that there. Uh, so you have different uh, subjects that uh, are discussed in the psalms. And uh, 
the penitent psalms or penitential psalms is one in which the author confesses his sin to God. So you see those there, and you have those psalms where uh, the author is confessing sin. As I said, Dave, Psalms 32 and 51 for David, he, he began to confess sin. So uh, maybe you're dealing with some sin in your life and you want to get right with God. These are some good psalms to, uh, to look at there. Then in precatory uh, psalms, to imprecate, to imprecate is to pray against or to invoke uh, judgment upon someone or something. Uh, there are many instances where the psalmist calls down wrath upon his enemies. Okay? So, uh, maybe uh, somebody's giving you a hard time and you want the Lord to handle that person. You know? <laughs> Let's face it, when you, uh, if you got bullied somewhere, if you had a big brother, you might have ran to that big brother and told him about it growing up. And uh, the Bible talks about Jesus being our brother. And then, uh, you know, if you were hurt or something, you might have ran to your dad and daddy. You know, God's our father. So in the same way, we, we run to our Abba Father, our God. We run to our Lord God, our brother. And uh, just sort of telling what's going on. And, uh, you know... Uh, let him know the situation. And you have many instances where they uh, pray to God to, and especially when they were uh, going to war, uh, in war, you know, for victory and those type of things. Uh, and you have a lot of discussion in, uh, about, uh, about asking God to do this, you know. Some people would say, you know, well, is it right to ask God to hurt somebody? You know, so it deals with all that, and you can study that, uh, study that in your own time. Also, on that uh, subject, just realize this: uh, government has certain authorities that, like a certain individual, doesn't. Uh, okay, so like uh, government's been given authority by God to execute uh, judgment, right, and justice, and to have courts and those type of things. So that's why I have a little bit of difference when we come into the, and see Jesus saying when, you know, turn the other cheek, okay, he's talking to the individual, he's talking to us as individuals. Uh, but at the same time, this has always been like a big controversy. What do you tell your kid who's getting bullied at school? Do you tell them, you know, sit there and take it? Do you tell them, hit back? Do you tell them, you know, your advice? So this has always been a key issue, not only amongst uh, you know the general population, but even within the church and and other believers. You know, what what would be the response? How would you direct uh, your child? So these are just some of the psalms that deal with things like that. Okay, so very important, and they're good to read when you're dealing with uh, a bully, or even as an adult, you're going to deal with that, or somebody just. Uh, causing you a lot of trouble or heartache or disturbance. And, uh, God will guide you and direct you in, in, in the way that you're to, to respond uh, through His Word. And then there's degree or sent Psalms, uh, 15 of them, <coughs> from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. The composers, all of these, is Hezekiah, Solomon, and David. Uh, many believe it was because uh, around 716 B.C., God healed a Judean king named Hezekiah of a fatal illness. Isaiah recorded, in, uh, Isaiah 38 recorded the prayer of thanksgiving of the king composed after his recovery. In verse 20, he exclaimed, The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. God not only healed Hezekiah, but promised him an additional 15 years of life. So some believe this was the reason that there are 15 degree psalms, his 10 plus 5 others, which may have been previously written by David and Solomon, and now added to 
the sacred Old Testament Canaan by Hezekiah. Uh, and how they were to be sung a certain way. Uh, so ascent, so we have the issue, music people could teach a lot on this subject, but you had a song in the, uh, the higher choir and uh, the stages, uh, not only of pilgrimage of Israel, but also in the, in the way they would sing it, okay? And uh, the way you would uh, sing the songs, okay? So uh, music, again, playing a very important, important role. You had the Hallelujah Psalms, six of them. Uh, these psalms were sung on the night of the Passover, Psalm 113 to 118. So when uh, you read in the New Testament, remember Jesus, before he died, he sent uh, his disciples out and uh, uh, to, he told them, prepare for the Passover. Okay, so they would have sung these psalms. So now you're getting a little uh, closer picture. Psalm 113 through 118. And they would have uh, sung, these, <coughs> sung these together. Uh, during uh, the close on uh, there. Uh, historical Psalms, three Psalms with a combined total of 165 verses. Uh, they summarize God's dealing with Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 78, 105, and 106. Wonderful Psalms. All of them's wonderful Psalms. And uh, historically, <coughs> you see. And they're important right now. What's going on with us? What's going on in your land? You see history repeat itself. So you could take uh, Psalm 78, Psalm 105, Psalm 106. And uh, you see uh, there. And, uh, over, and over again, you see uh, uh, the sins of Israel and the grace of God. And uh, you, you can see that in your life. You can see that in uh uh, human nature, you can see that historically in nations, the sins of the nations, the grace of God, the turning, how God uh, does a mighty work. You see that throughout the whole Bible. You see the failures of man, the uh, insufficiency of man, but you see the uh, perfection of God, the sufficiency of God, the grace of God, okay? So God's grace, we always uh, rely on that. Acrostic psalms, uh, there are at least nine acrostic psalms. Acrostic, acrostic psalms are also known as the alphabetical psalms. This is so because each line of these psalms begins with a successive letter in the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Psalm 119, the most famous of the acrostic psalms, it has 22 stanzas. Each stanzas, stanza has eight verses for a total of 176. Each of these stanzas begins with one of the 22 Hebrew letters. Not all of these psalms are complete in this arrangement. That is, some are missing a letter or more uh, and different, but that was the key of acrostic, uh, using the alphabet okay, uh, in that sense. A lot of people preach, a lot of times you would use, like if you have three points, they, all, they, they can all start, say they all start with a C, okay? So, you know, the confusion of all things, the conversion of the people, the, uh, then you could have another C, whatever that is, you know, and that'd be, so this is a tool, a well-used tool that, uh, you know, I certainly have tried to apply uh, in preaching many times, and uh, that God applied with His Word. Okay, and what it is, it helps people remember. Okay, it helps people remember. What's that uh, song? Uh, the twelve uh, uh, at Christmas time. The twelve has twelve. Uh, you know, twelve. Twelve. Yeah. Huh. The, yeah, the long one, you know, nobody. What is it? Twelve days of Christmas. Twelve days of Christmas, okay? So, and it's originality, you know, that sounds just like a, a weird uh, song now, you know. And some new artist, you know, will change it up and uh, make fun. But in its original, it was uh, so the, 
the kids, it taught the kids how to remember different things from the Bible, okay? And uh, you had the, uh, you know, you had the, uh, the five, the Pentateuch, and you had, you know, each one meant uh, something. And uh, if we were around Christmas time, I'd go to it all, but we're not. But anyway, so that's, that's what.